everyone. Thanks for being here. We appreciate it. Good afternoon. Um, we're so excited to welcome you to Fordham University today, both in person and online, to join us for Respecting Diversity Through Joint Social Action, Reframing Disability as Ability. The Global Student Conference occurs annually in tandem with Social Work Day at the UN, which is celebrating its 39th year this year. The student conference was born out of students' desire to engage interpersonally about topics discussed at Social Work Day at the UN. For that reason, throughout today's event, we encourage you all to participate, form connections, and ask questions. This is true even for the folks joining us on the webinar through the Q&A function. Today's event was planned by a lovely group of diverse students. Um, in doing so, the question of accountability arose often. How will people access the building? Will there be QR code access to the program, et cetera? In introducing myself today, I might tell you verbally that I'm an olive-skinned young woman with brown wavy hair and brown eyes. There are a myriad of things that we can do to make our events and our lives more accessible and a million ways in which we can do better. We cohabitate a world in which a sustained, inaccessible environment contributes to social stigma and discrimination for individuals with both seen and unseen disabilities. The onus of responsibility frequently rests with the individual to figure it out rather than on society to address visible and invisible barriers to education, employment, healthcare, housing, and other social services. Disabilities approach differently according to where someone is located geographically, their sexual and gender identities, and their socioeconomic status. Recognition of these intersections are essential for our work. To address disability is to address human rights to dignity, access, and accountability. Social workers play an absolutely crucial role in awareness building around these issues, assisting in the creation of systems that don't just respond to the needs of all people, but truly change systems through recognition of their strengths. This is exactly what we're here to do today, and we're thrilled to have such incredible speakers here to help us do so. Hello, everyone. The Global Social Work Student Conference is hosted by students, support students, but we can't do it alone. For that reason, we want to express our immense thanks to Fordham, Monmouth, Yukon, Rutgers, and Adelphi, and to the International Federation of Social Workers, International Association of Schools of Social Work, and the Institute for Clinical Social Work, for sponsoring this event. And to our student volunteers and Connor White, Matthew Roche, Trish Rodriguez, Dr. Gable, Dr. Mama, Shanae Osborne, Rebecca Davis, Dr. Gronin, Dr. Healy, and Dr. Krongus. Thank you for your consistent support in this effort. And finally, to our incredibly informed and accomplished speakers, we have been humbly moved and honored by your work and are grateful for your willingness to share your knowledge and personal experiences in person and online. Participants will have the chance to ask questions to our speakers after their pre presentation. We will limit questions due to time constraints, but we encourage our participants to reach out to our speakers during the networking portion of the conference. So with that being said, it is my pleasure to give my colleague Kazoom the floor to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Mary Beth Bruder. Thank you so much for that lovely intro. So uh, my name is Kasum again. Welcome everybody. I am representing Ad Ad Adalfa and it is, yep. it is my honor to introduce Dr. Mary Beth Bruder. So Dr. Bruder has been in the early childhood intervention um, field since 1976. She began her career as an early childhood intervention public school teacher. Here we have her. Uh, in the Vermont, uh, where she worked with Head Start and inclusive child care programs. She received her PhD from the University of Oregon in Developmental Disabilities in 1983. Since 1986, Bruder, Dr. Bruder has been at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine, where she is a professor in public health sciences, pediatrics, and educational psychology. Um, she Currently directs the University of Connecticut AJ Papaniko Center of Excellence in Developmental Disabilities Education, uh, Research and Service. During her career, uh, Dr. Bruder has directed multiple federal and state research demonstrations, trainings, and technical assistance projects. Dr. Bruder is the editor of Infants and Young, Ch uh, Young Children, an interdisciplinary journal of early childhood intervention, and she chairs the International Society of Early Childhood Intervention and the Association of University uh, Centers on Disabilities Early Childhood Special Interest Group as well. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Bruner. I'll just pass it on to you now. 
Thank you. It is such a privilege to be a part of this day. It is a unique day, and I hope the beginning of a pattern that Zug uh, Association Social Work student continued. Uh, I'm thrilled to be able to highlight an area of study that I've been in, as you can see, for uh, oh, probably 50 years. I started out, I am a New Yorker, which also gives me great pleasure, uh, uh, really pleasure at being here. I've been born in the Bronx, grew up until I was 10 in the Bronx, and have lots of relatives. And actually, some of my relatives, like, lived right on the street where Fordham in. So I have known about Fordham for a long time, and um, I have also had 16 years of Catholic um, education. So this really done free everything all for me. I started out in the era when kids with disabilities were educated separately than other kids. And they became the others early on. In fact, I grew up with a kiddo across the street who now we would label as having autism, and he never went to school. And we just thought it was the way it was. Um, I was lucky enough to start out as a champ counselor up in, uh, we had moved up to Katona at that point, when somebody revolutionary, because it was revolutionary, started a day camp for kids with disabilities in our town. And so as a sophomore or junior in high school, I got to be a, a camp counselor. And the reason I'm starting out with that story is because one person made a difference back then. They said it wasn't fair that kids who did not have disabilities had access to pretty much free day camp in the summers in the towns where we lived, but kids with disabilities couldn't go. Uh, he made the decision. He happened to be the rec director. He happened to play golf with my father, who my father volunteered me, and we got a bunch of people together as part of day camp. So the reason that the important is I will go and touch end with it. Leadership takes with all forms and shape. And you never know when you're going to be expected to step into a role that, the, that puts you in a leadership position. So don't take that light look. Um, I really have the, um, the honor of starting this wonderful program off that I'm not going to take a lot of time. I want to first acknowledge and really do a call out to the students who have been working so hard to put this day together. And they really have. Uh, their hearts are into it. They give me great, great faith in the future the future of disability, and the future of changing the world, because that's why we're all here. Um, this is not new to um, most of you, but one in four people in the United States has a disability. Now, some of those disabilities happen with people like me who are getting old, um, and that is aging as a disability. But a majority actually start off life or either with a disability or a condition that leads to a disability. But basically, what we know is that our world has people with disabilities just as it has people with ability. Some of the disabilities are um, hidden, and some of them are quite out front. I would like to say in the 50 or some odd years that I have been working and been the privilege of working with people with disabilities, uh, I have seen changes. I have. I have seen really wonderful things. But we still have a long way to go for full acceptance and fall equal rights for people with disabilities in this country and in the world. Um, when we look at what, what we have, I always go back to the WHO definition because it really puts the onus on how people um, really are able to navigate it. We need, and I think when we look very specifically at what we're trying to do, um, we know that disability is a condition of human life. And to be human means to accept all forms of human life. So as we look at how we're creating a society of acceptance, and now more than ever, we have loads of isms in our um, vocabulary, ableism being a front and always has been. I would want to remind people that we're here to show our humanness, not just human kindness, but ability to see the big picture um, by going forward. I um, represent the Davies and I had to have uh, university centers on disabilities, education, research, and training. These are 63 centers across the country, created to legislation by President Kennedy. Our a foot mission is very long, but there's a couple of pieces that jump out. One is that we are interdisciplinary and recognize no one discipline can serve any anybody in this world, and especially people who have disabilities or are at risk and or have conditions that may lead to disability. But secondarily is creating leadership so that we may take the knowledge that is being built at a university and translate it into practice of policy. And that's where we have a while ways to go. The developmental disabilities task 
which governs a lot of our centers in the, in the country. And I want those of you in the United States to recognize that these are resources for you. If New York State have three, um, the closest to you guys to, is Einstein um, right now. But to recognize the development of the disabilities is a group of conditions. Okay, it is not one condition into a group of conditions. And people who have any of these conditions have experienced disparity. Can't talk about equity without recognizing disparity. There is disparities in the way people are treated, in the way people are thought about, and in the way they are provided services. And the, the last one is, is these becoming more and more apparent. And if you take the intersectionality of somebody who has a disability, self disclosed or not, and interface it with anybody who's gender characteristics may be different, or racial characteristics, or ethnic characteristics, or language characteristics, you are really creating even more disparity. The data are real. The data in access to health care, to education care, to employment, to full living in a community are out there. This is not a day to provide data, although you certainly can make that available. And I ask you as part of your responsibility to your um, profession to make sure that everything you talk about is data-based. Because we have a lot of data, a lot of data that tells us where we need to change and what we need to do. As we look forward to creating better future for anybody who be different, I ask you to remember that there are a lot of things that we can do for people with disabilities. And that starts with attitudes and beliefs. And the belief of confidence. We talk about two things whenever we're doing any work in the space of disability, led by people with disabilities, and one is nothing about us without us. So that everything we do has to have authentic voices, which is why I'm so thrilled about this um, program for this afternoon. You're going to hear from the expert. And then the second thing is a school of competence in every interaction you have with another human and especially with people who might have a label that they're carrying around. Um, that leads to a disability when people have um, focus on their disability and opposed to their abilities. We want to celebrate confidence wherever we see it. We all need help. We all are interdependent. And now more than ever do we need to step up for all of our, all of human humankind across the world. Um, I'm going to end with just leadership and the responsibility of leadership. Leadership does not belong to any one discipline or any one title. Leadership is really the action of leading a group of people or an organization or um, just stepping out front. I always tell my students, step up and step in because you have a role to play. It really is a set of behaviors that helps people align their collective vision. And that's the hardest part we have in this country right now. We've never been so divisive um, to execute strategic, long-term plan to improve society. And we want to make sure that we are political. We, we really are political, but we don't play politics. Again, I mentioned divisiveness. Um, part of how we treat others is contextually bound in the political will of a nation, a country, the world. And our job is to not let politics divide anybody, to not look anywhere into um, partisan um, position, word, and ease and that being the um, direction of what you're doing. So political savviness means to recognize that we're all in this together, be able to bypass any division or divisiveness that may be there, and take the role of stepping in and stepping out. I'm going to close up one thing that I would love you all to look at if you really want to have the reality without me pointing out all the statistics. There's a wonderful documentary film that has come out. Uni, one of my students in the interdisciplinary program that we run, has seen it. It's called Forget Me Not. Unfortunately, it demonstrates some of what's happening in New York for uh, students with disabilities. And while we know there are wonderful people in nuclear ship and we're going to go forward, we still have a reality of families for early on having to struggle to get accepted, to get noticed, to get celebrated with the differences that their children may have, their sisters, uh, their sibling. And as we go forward, we know we have to carry that vision of equity and really inclusivity, which is we use the word belonging now because everybody shouldn't belong. We should not have others as we go forward to really change the system. And that's all I have to say, except telling you that you are in a wonderful place in history. 
because as much as I just told you the negative or in a divisive part, you can change it. And I know you will change it. And that just by accepting and changing your attitude that one person can make a difference, whether it's starting a day camp or whether it's going out and, and starting to push for inclusion and in public school, or whether it's giving more employment for people who have disabilities. We have horrendous statistics in employment in this country for people with disabilities and for independent living and transportation. There's a lot for us to do, and I just pray and hope that you will do it. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruder, for talking to us to about, about the value of interdisciplinarity, intersectionality, and most importantly, about listening to experts in a time that's very politically and even societally polarized and for nonpartisan politics on the rights of disabilities. Now, I'm very honored to introduce our next speaker, Ulusa, Ulusola Obanoki. Unoko, I'm really, really sorry. Uh, he works at the intersection of inclusion, business, and technology. His work at Project Enable Africa is bridging the gap between the demand and supply of talents with disabilities in the formal and informal sectors towards equitable access to economic opportunities. His organization has provided training and support services to over 250 organizations to develop inclusive practices, policies, and programs, and trained over 5,000 young persons with disabilities in eight years. Olusola is promoting disability diversity, equity, and inclusion in workplaces and legislations to enable people with disabilities to fully participate in employment and civic life. He is an Obama Foundation scholar at Columbia University. We thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. All is right. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm so delighted to be here. I think this is the first um, disability focus event that I've been part of in New York. And I've been here for almost um, a year. Uh, usually disabilities discussed as part of larger issues, but I also think it's important that there is focus. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to quickly talk about the work that we do in Nigeria uh, that a true project in April Africa, uh, basically uh, sharing our own story, how we started what we do uh, almost nine years ago now, what we've been doing and the different pivots that we've done and why we had to pivot through some of those uh, processes. Uh, my name is Olushala Owenikoko. I'm from Nigeria, uh, Lagos, Nigeria. If you've been to Lagos, it's pretty much like New York. If you have not been, please plan to. Uh, maybe that's why I like New York. All right, so um, generally, uh, the focus of our work has been true, has been on uh, promoting disability empowerment, inclusion, uh, social inclusion, and uh, disability rights in all. And, and that's like the larger framework. But as we get onto this work, we realize that that is really broad and it's extremely difficult for one organization to focus on all of this. So. Uh, we have done more in terms of empowerment. And there's a reason why we decided to focus on empowerment. Um, but before that, I'll tell you the story of how this project started, because that is one question I get to answer a lot. Uh, in 2013, I, just, I completed my undergraduate program in 2010. And then in Nigeria, there's this um, compulsory youth service you have to do. In another part of the country, it's basically to promote integration within the country. So upon returning to Lagos after that program, I was thinking of what to do. I'd started to work in the international development space yeah, because I learned about the MDG, MDGs, you know, I was interested. But I also wanted to focus a bit more. So at that point, I was working in public health, uh, promoting um, um, prevention of HIV, AIDS, you know, access to, um, you know, um, antiretroviral diseases and all of those. And um, I mean, antiretroviral drugs. But I, I felt that was a lot of people were working in that space. And then one day I moved out of my parent house that I moved to another part of town that I was new to. And there's this national stadium, the biggest, the biggest stadium in Nigeria was there. And in front of that stadium, I noticed that there, there was like an aggregation of a lot of persons with disabilities there. You know, every day I would go by in public bus and just see them. So I, I 
I became interested. So one day I got down and went to have a conversation with them. And I realized that these were Paralympians who were not getting paid uh, from the government. They only get, you know, when there are competitions, they get, you know, um, into to practice and all. But beyond that, and that is pretty much most part of the year because competition probably happens two, three times a year. They, they are doing nothing. So many of them as many of them resort to, you know, drug use, um, just things to make ends meet, you know, one way or the other, is, you know, legalizing and all sort of things. So I, I was really surprised, to be honest, that uh, the government would not pay attention to uh, a, a group of people that were already marginalized uh, because unemployment rate was high in the country, but for, for, for the community of persons with disabilities, so I, the conversation started by, by me asking them, what can I do to help? You know, and that was how the organization started. And of course, at that point that I was asking the question, I wasn't sure. And then two weeks later, I was in a tricycle. I don't know if you're familiar with the tricycle. Uh, it's used popularly in Lagos to um, get around. Uh, we prefer it to the regular buses because you can maneuver traffic with it, you know, uh, it, they just have a wheel, and it's relatively safer compared to motorcycle. So I was in tricycle. So traditionally in the tricycle, you have three people sit at the back, and then just the rider in front. But when you get to the, to the bus stop and the tricycle is full at the back, you plead with the rider so you can sit in front. So what then happens is you are like seated halfway. The driver too is seated out. It's not the best thing to do, but we do it, right? So I remember that day I was seated like one part of my butt, you know, holding the... If the tricycle swap too fast, you might fall off if you're not holding well. Anyways, I realized that day that the person riding the tricycle was a person with physical disability. And that was surprising to me because I didn't expect or rule or realize that a person with disability can ride a tricycle. And it was like a light, I mean, bulb, you know, a light bulb moment in my mind. Like, wait, the problem was never the guy with the disability. The problem was the tricycle manufacturer or the society that couldn't adapt to the person with disability. And right there in that tricycle was the beginning of Project Enable Africa. Because from that point on, all I wanted to do was to get the society to meet the needs of persons with disability. Either riding a tricycle, riding a car, going to school, going around the society. I just strongly knew that the disability was not the problem. Because we didn't have, you, many times we don't have control over that. Well, we have control over our society's views. So why don't we do something about that? Of course, many years later, I realized that was a social model of disability that says that the society is the disabling factor, not the impairment of persons with disability. And that was how we started. And of course, we started by empowering persons with disabilities with skills uh, to you know, be able to produce, uh, make product that they can sell. After two years of doing that, we realize again that the problem is not, we are not solving the problem because persons with disabilities can create things, but the society do not patronize because the disability is also transferred to the product. So the products are not just seen as a product, they are seen for as products of people with disability, and that's part of the problem. Then I, we, we started to realize that the attitude, attitude is the biggest disabling factor, not even the law. The law comes secondary. Not, not, you know, the things that people do, but with the wrong attitude, the mindset. So that was how we got into advocacy. From then, we've organized stakeholders meeting at least once every quarter to bring key stakeholders together and then bring persons with disabilities together, come together, have a conversation. Another discovery is people don't see disability. You can walk around the society if you're not a person with disability and not see, and not realize not that there are no people with disability around, but we are just not in, in the condition to see it, especially in Nigeria, you know, where I, where I was working at that point. So it was important that we started to create narratives, bring persons with disabilities to share their story. What are their struggles? What are the things they've overcome? What are the things we you know yet to be overcome? And that was transformational. Because at that point, I realized that we, Nigeria did not have a national disability up until that point, and there's been a lot of struggle and work to get that done. There's been, there was an initial draft that was sent to the president, but it did, uh, there was no presidential assent, so it didn't become law, and that is all because disability wasn't seen as a priority. 
So we joined in that uh, advocacy, especially bringing uh, evidence uh, in, from research, and I'll talk about some of the important research we've done, to also bring in persons with disabilities themselves to share their story. You know, because I, we, we realize that for, poli for policy makers, if things do not make economic terms, it's difficult for them to engage with it. How does it add to the GDP? So we started to uh, build the narrative in GDP terms, in economic terms, you know, bringing important statistics and evidence that people cannot say no to. And part of that evidence is that uh, it is not just 15% of our population. In Nigeria, I would think it's more. Uh, that are with disability or that are impacted by disability. There is another population set called caregivers whose productivity are also reduced because they have to do things that the system can do, that the community can do. Uh, they have to spend their time doing that. So they are also really, really underproductive and they are not paid for that. And that is where, you know, social work, especially for women who are a lot in, in a lot of cases in Nigeria, women are social workers. And they, that is not seen as something to be paid for. So it is not just a 15% of persons with disabilities that are, uh, we are under maximizing. It is also that uh, people who are affected by the situation. So bringing all of those forward in 2019, finally, Nigeria uh, signed the National Disability Bill and gave a five-year period for everybody to adjust. And that became another moment uh, of transition for, for us. So in, in 2019, uh, 2018 actually, we realized that, okay, our society was not inclusive and making a society inclusive is going to take a long time because it involves systemic change. But then in the short while, ICT provides a unique opportunity because behind ICT, productivity is what people watch out for. Disability is not um, amplified, so to say. So we, we decided to do a lot of ICT training. And then we did this research to even understand what I, access to ICT means for persons with disability. And we came up with this five, seven, eight, seven A framework, which talk about for ICT to be accessible for persons with disabilities, it has to be available. Not just available, people, especially those who need to use it, they have to be aware of it. Beyond awareness, affordability. For a country like Nigeria, especially, and many other developing countries, that is important because the cost of clearing or uh, importation duties placed on some of these things make them really expensive. And an example is uh, a, a screen reader, for example, is as much as $1,000. In some cases, maybe even more. The average person with disability is, is, is poor or, you know, some, in some cases in extreme poverty. And what that means is they spend less than two dollars a day, some, sometimes even less than one dollar. So how do you expect such a person to buy? And you know all of that factors. And of course, ability is there. If they can afford, if they are aware about this, how can they learn how to use it? So these are areas where there are a lot of gaps. And adaptability is important. Many soft um, screen readers coming from here, as an example, in American language, I mean English, that you can that it, uh, regular Nigeria might not. They speak English too, but it's, it's difficult to understand. So how can we make some of these things available in our local language? Or how can we make wheelchairs using locally available resources? You know, how can we make a uh, guide cane using locally available resources so that we can cut down on the cost and all? So the five A's represent tech-centric uh, factors. The last two are human-centric because technology has to be human-focused. Attitude. The attitude, and remember I mentioned earlier that the biggest disabling factor is the attitude of persons with disabilities the society, and of course the persons with disability, because the, one of the shocking discovery I had working in the society is there is also intra-discrimination, not just external discrimination. And that has been foiled over years of vulnerability. When people have been really vulnerable and marginalized, then they have um, a, a mindset that things, there is no surplus. So they want to keep things for themselves, and that creates friction and one group or close up of persons with disabilities are not in, in line with the others and you know, that becomes an issue. And I, I think the most important one is agency. Bringing persons with disabilities together to put whatever micro power they might have together to form a mega power. And that has been the center of our work uh, till, till date, to not just be the face of our organization, but to empower persons with disabilities and put them forward so that 
persons with disabilities can lead the conversation. And um, I'll share some of the success stories we've had. Uh, hopefully, we have time. The other research we did was a labor market assessment. Uh, we're supported by site savers to do that, which is even understanding what is the gap in the labor market with respect to persons with disabilities. We're asking three questions. What are the um, aspirations of persons with disabilities? What are the skills that they have? And what are the skills that employers need? You know, and there was obviously a huge uh, misfit uh, because um, there's gap. In many cases, when persons with disabilities grow up in rehabilitation centers, go to blind-only schools, deaf-only schools, it becomes extremely difficult to get jobs in a world where everybody is. Because all their lives, what they've been trained to do is interact with other people like them. So those represent some form of soci psychosocial uh, needs that need to be filled. But also, even for persons with disabilities who, are, who have been to school are educated, communication skills is, is, is lacking because communication is not what they're focusing on. And in cases where people are persons with disabilities, their disabilities are communication-related disabilities, even more difficult, right? So th those are some of the things. So we decided to uh, pivot a bit and focus on, for at least for two years, equipping persons with disabilities with digital skills so that they are en enabled uh, to go to school from their homes because with tech, you can go to school anywhere in the world, uh, do jobs and all of those. So that became, um, I, I remember we partnered with Google to set up an inclusion hub in Nigeria where we have trained thousands of persons with disabilities from 2018 to 19 until uh, till date. So summarizing some of the work that we do, I'm trying to rush through this because of time. Um, the youth employment program, and the message there is, it is not just that there's ability in disability. I think that's becoming a narrative that needs to be upgraded. The new message is there's productivity in ability. It's not just that I can get things done, it is that I can achieve results as a person with disability. Because for employers, it's productivity is a language, and that is important. And this is really addressing the supply side. So we have a one more long training program where we bring people from high school certificates, uh, those who have high school older uh, certificates, old um, certificates, high school certificate holders to tertiary uh, education uh, certificate holders, training them on true mentorship, uh, you know, and all, and placing them in jobs. We also pay them to come for those training. We pay us two, three months of salary and internship, and the hope and goal is that employers are able to transition. And the success story we've had there is that we've placed, um, in, the, in the last one year post-COVID, we've placed over 250, and we've had 60% job retention. The, what happens is when employers come in contact with persons with disabilities, first of all, they are shocked. Secondly, they are open, and then they see that, oh, I've been wrong all my life. So much that one of our employer partners, Sheraton, decided that they are going to have more, person, uh, more persons with hearing impairments in their kitchen because they reported that concentration level is higher for that group and distraction is lower. Those are some of the things we don't talk about. You know, what are the unique contributions that persons with certain disabilities can bring? One of our employer partners decided to give more opportunities to uh, persons with visual impairment in their customer care center because well, for, for some reason, they know how to use those, um, the software better. They iterate, inter, I mean, uh, interact with the software that they use better. And because it's all hearing and all, it's easy for them to talk. And in many cases, they speak even better, right? Uh, get to learn better and all. So uh, 60%, and I think that, was a that is a success because uh, for an organization that is doing the first of that kind of program in Nigeria, I think that's come a long way. Uh, and we are hoping we can improve that number. The second one is to, to address the demand side, right? We, we started the Workplace Disability Inclusion Program, which provides free technical uh, support to corporate organizations. One of our discovery during the labor market assessment is employers don't know what to do. Sometimes they, are, they discriminate, but sometimes they just don't know what to do and they don't want to get in trouble in the press. So they say no altogether. But we are here saying, no, wherever you are, you can start from there. You might not be able to employ a person with physical impairment because your office is on the third floor. That is not good, but that is where you are. Can you start with other type of disability and let's create a five or 10 year plan?
plan for you to be fully inclusive. And that also has been successful. We've supported over 250 organizations uh, training. We just started a, a new partnership with MasterCard to train additional set of this uh, organization. And that uh, we are really looking forward to. And you can see some of the employer partners we have. The first organization that jumped on board were organizations with offices beyond Nigeria. And that was easy because they have global disability framework which some local organizations do not understand how to relate to. But when an organization like Unilever jumped on board and Sheraton, then it was easy for organizations within their sector to also jump on board. And it went on uh, from there. And this year, we are looking to do even more with that. And of course, we realized that not everybody would want to go on the employment track. So we have the business support program for entrepreneurs with disability. This is training them on business skills, so giving them business support services. We have counselors, we have, they have mentors, access to finance. Once in a year, we have the business fair where they come together to show their product, we bring stakeholders and all. And the goal really is to create an alternative economic opportunity apart from our um, employment track uh, for, for people. And um, so caregivers, um, we realize we're living a group behind. Uh, first of all, there are children with disabilities. We don't work directly with children with disabilities. But by supporting caregivers, we can support, uh, you know, that population. But also the caregivers themselves, many times they are busy. They cannot go out to work. They have to be there. But with technical digital skills, you can have your computer there, you know, run things, get some money. And we know the world is getting more digitalized. So with this, we've trained over a thousand people. Many of them, at least 70% of them have started businesses. Some of them don't even have formal businesses, but they can be digital marketers. They can be these, they can, and sometimes just WhatsApp marketing, you know, whatever it is that is available. We also try to give computers where we have the means to, so that they can start uh, businesses. All of this is really just addressing uh, three things, which I think forms the framework of economic access. The first one is access to income and assets. That is power. Civic participation is not possible or easy when people don't have income, right? So when there is job or business, then uh, income and assets. Beyond that is control and benefit from economic gains. So it's not just making money, but who is in control of that money? That is important. The third one is the power to make decisions. And in the last three years, we've supported about three persons with disabilities who are running for offices now in Nigeria. Uh, one of them got to be a special assistant to the Speaker of the National Assembly, which is huge. And then the others haven't won a um, seat yet, but it's progressive. Uh, trying to round up within a few minutes. So key issues still. As much as we've addressed all of this, we still have uh, a big gap in inclusive formal education. And uh, we can talk more about that informal training opportunities. So the next stage we are going to now is digital centers around the country. How can we train them to be inclusive? Because we can only train so much in our own home. There are 25 million persons with disabilities in Nigeria. We've trained just two or three thousands in the, in the past five years. So we have to do more. So that is how we are scaling. Digital inclusion, reasonable accommodation is still a big deal for organizations, either because they don't want to invest or because they don't even understand what it means. Funding dynamics for programs. Uh, and I think there's a lot to talk about there, but maybe we'll take it down question and answer. Agencies or community policies instrument very big. It's not enough to have national policies. We have to um, domesticate them. And of course, there's research. Um, I will stop there. Uh, sorry, <laughs> there's so much I have to say. But the summary there is systems thinking is the way to go. Uh, I hope we get to talk about that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Yunus Nida. I am one of the co-chairs for uh, the planning committee for this conference. Um, it is amazing to see the initiatives like uh, Project Enable Africa, uh, focusing on reframing the perspective of disability and providing sustainable employment through training, mentorship, and business formalization support to entrepreneurs with disabilities. Uh, thank you so much, Ozola, for that amazing talk. I think it really uh, helped us focus out when the perspectives that um, employment can really make a big difference for people with disabilities. Talking about reframing perspectives, I am excited to present our following speaker. Unfortunately, she's having some issues hopping in um, 
awesome today, but we have her backup presentation. She is from Nigeria as well. So Benedicta Odudaro Ojiwoli is an intersectional feminist passionate about disability and women's rights. She works and lives at the nexus of multiple identities and is interested in the interconnectedness of sexuality, disability, black men, and gender justice. She's a pro officer at the Women's Health and Equal Rights Initiative. She is a fellow of the Disability Justice Project and a graduate of CREA, Disability, Sexuality, and Rights Online Institute. Following uh, Benedicta's presentation, Myra would lead us up to an activity that emphasizes some points that we have discussed here so far. With that being said, um, we're going to play up the presentation for Benedicta. Hello there. My name is Benedicta Oyedario Oyewole. My pronouns are she, are, and I'm joining the Students' Conference from Ibadan, Nigeria. I'm popularly introduced as an intersectional evangelist. I work and live at the intersection of multiple marginalized identities. I'm a person with disability. I'm a woman with disability. I'm a queer woman with disability. And these identities cannot be separated. You will wonder, why am I here talking about my identities and how they intersect? Like, what exactly am I on to? But I'm here to offer you something, and that thing is a prism. It is a lens, and just like the one I'm wearing, only that it just might not be as, you know, visible as this one. We can call it an invisible lens, but it is a necessary and important lens in the work we do and in the life we lead. And this lens is a prism through which we examine how different forms of inequalities interact with each other and as collaborate to create this old loop of inequality just as we see in the world today. And to also highlight the hidden structural barriers that exist within movements and also highlighting oppression within oppression. As a woman with disability, and as someone who has been with a disability all my life. Living in Nigeria, the co poverty capital of the world, I've experienced various forms of discrimination and marginalization on the basis of my disability status. Compounded with harmful traditional norms and practices, as well as discriminatory laws and policies towards my identities as a woman, as a queer woman, and as a disabled Woman. In 2022, um, we saw how a lot of structural barriers and a lot of structural inequalities were alighted at the brink of COVID. And that was the moment for me. That was the moment of joining into identities. That was the moment of joining into knowing and, and formation of action. We call it convening conversation for action. Prior to 2020, I'd been involved in activism in my hometown, but I never highlighted myself as a person bringing all my identities to the table to say, yes, this is what I'm championing. This is what I'm fighting against. This is what I'm fighting for. Although we were fighting against patriarchy, we were fighting against inequality, we were fighting against poverty, but we never really took time to critically analyze and say the fact that you have these identities excavate the way you live through world and it also excavates your um, lived realities as a queer disabled woman living in Nigeria. So 2022, at the brink of COVID, um, you know, it's opened my eyes. It showed me the level of inequalities that was already existed in the system. Yes. Let me take that again. At the brink of COVID 2020, 2020 it showed me the level of inequality and marginalization that was already in existence through the system. How we were denied health care, basic services that ought to be rendered to people, all because of our disability status, of our gender identities. The issues of persons with disabilities exist at the nexus of multiple identities. And these identities do not exist in isolation. These identities overlap themselves. Intersectionality amplifies the voices of those who often experience overlapping and concurrent forms of inequality and it amplifies their voice. It also gives us 
a way to understand the depth of inequality and the relationship among them in every given context. So intersectionality does not look at oppression as it's just a disability issue or a LGBTQI plus right or a Black Lives Matter like issue. It looks at how in within the Black Lives Matter movement, there are Black trans people, there are disabled Black people, there are Black disabled queer people, there are queer women, there are queer women who are sex workers. So intersectionality explores the depths to which inequality operates. As we are joined together at this student conference today, I am not just here speaking as a woman with disability. I am here speaking to you as a woman with disability living in Nigeria. And I'm also imploring you in practice, in living, in leading, to constantly explore who exactly is should be in this table that is not in that is not in this table. It is a very critical project required of us to examine and cross-examine and consistently start interception of our movement, of our work, of our daily living, and constantly ask ourselves, who am I leaving behind? Who should be on this table that is not on this table? Whose voices are being oppressed? And there is your answer. The people that are not in this table are the people that should be on this table today speaking 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 one great thing about intersectionality is it is very affirmative in practice because it just says to this to people who are left behind societally conditioned to be left behind it is telling them i see you i hear you i i believe you and this affirmation is a very first step to dismantling and breaking down the walls of inequality and the walls of oppression. During the American um, Disability Act, the president at the time says, let the walls of oppression come crushing down. So in order for the world, walls of oppression to come crumbling down, just like the walls of Jericho, we need to practice intersectionality. We need to put intersectionality into practice. And in doing so, we need to recognize that identities are not homogeneous. Persons with disabilities are not just persons with disabilities. Understanding the depth of inequalities that exist within the disability rights movement, we enable us to move forward in actively pursuing equality that we all strive for in all aspects of our work. Reframing intersectionality to encompass solution in various spaces such as the life we lead, the work we do, where we go to, is an ongoing process. Intersectionalities are symptoms for which we must all strive for. There is no single process of intersectionality that we automatically check out the intersectionality box. It is a muscle we must all strive and practice and exercise. So I'm wanting to walk out of this door today knowing that the disability rights movement is not homogeneous. People live and exist at the intersection of multiple overlapping identities, and these identities cannot be separated. So I'm passing the lens to you now. I'm passing the prism to you to work in intersectionality, to know that persons with disabilities do not just have disability as their identities but there are overlapping identities that escalate and create this huge sum of inequalities. Therefore, intersectionality is not a box that we can automatically tick off, but it is a muscle we have to constantly keep practicing in our everyday life. Intersectionality is action, and you should join the train soon. Thank you very much. My name is Benedicta Oyedayo Oyewale. My pronouns are she, uh, and I'm speaking to you from Ibadan, Nigeria. Thank you. It's working this time. <laughs> so, um, before we move on, we wanted to do just a little bit of a small activity just to emphasize the point that we wanted to make as a theme for this conference. As someone who recently uh, was diagnosed with a chronic illness, um, before that, I used to think that disability rights was something of a separate issue. This was one separately packaged 
social justice issue. It wasn't something that was pervasive at, in the lives of normal quote unquote people. And that kind of mentality is, I feel like we can find it in words such as special people, calling them special people, special as in different, special as in separated from normal society. So the activity we want to do is based on this experiment that wants to show how pervasive disability can be, disability issues can be in everybody's life, and there's no such thing as this normal and disabled binary. So it's a very simple activity. I'm going to pose a question to you all. If you resonate with it, just raise your hand. I'll pause for a second and look around to see who else has raised their hand. Then we'll move on to the second question and the third question and so on. So let's go. Have you ever experienced yourself or witnessed someone being discriminated against because of their disability? Please raise your hand if you have. Now please look around to see how many people have raised their hands. You may lower your hands. Have you ever participated in an event or an activity that was extremely inaccessible to people with disabilities? Please raise your hand if you have. Again, please look around. Thank you. Now let's look at a positive. Have you ever been inside a public infrastructure or attended an event that has been super inclusive and you just remember it as the shining star in your memory of good disability <laughs> accessibility? Have you ever attended such an event? Please raise your hand. And now look around. Are you or someone you know a caretaker of a person with disabilities? Now look around. How pervasive that is. Do you have or have you met someone who has a disability that is not immediately visible? Again, please just look around and reflect on that thought. And then finally, do you know someone who has a health condition that is not recognized as a traditional disability but very deeply affects their quality of life? It might not be diagnosed or it might be diagnosed. Thank you, my lower your hands. And that was the point, to separate and destroy that binary that there is a binary between the normal people and people with disabilities. Very pervasive, and it's an issue that affects each and every one of us very personally. Thank you for participating, and I hope you could reflect on that a bit. I'm going to pass the mic for Q&A. But for the activity, I want to thank Myra um, for kind of leading that. It's important even like as social workers and in other occupations as well that we're centering ourselves in our lived experiences and the lived experiences of those around us um, so that, that those things can help with our practice. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. And she is someone who um, does a lot of that centering work in her work uh, through her life experiences. Um, so perfect segue, so for the introduction, Reverend Dr. Holly Bonner is an award-winning interfaith minister, mental health professional, educator, writer, and creator of the informative website, Blind Motherhood. Dr. Bonner established her site in 2012 after losing her vision and becoming legally blind. Blind Motherhood's mission is to demonstrate members of the blind and visually impaired community can parent safely, independently, and effectively. Bonner holds an MPA from Metropolitan College of New York and an MSW from Columbia University. She acquired a third master's degree in pastoral care and counseling and her doctorate in ministry. In 2022, she was the recipient of the R. R. Lewis Scholarship at Theological Seminary's Episcopal Divinity School, where she achieved her fourth master's degree in sacred theology. Bonner is the director of spirituality and civic engagement at Wagner College. Within this role, she helps to educate the campus community about various faith denominations while connecting students to civic learning opportunities. She has 20 years of nonprofit experiences and teaches courses in civic engagement, leadership, strategic planning, and disability studies. Her first children's book, Blind Mom, Monster Detective, will be released by IP Books in winter of 2023. Bonner's theological text, Breaking the Tape, The Fight for Disability Rights in the Episcopal Church, is also pending publication. Bonner serves on the board of directors of Nonprofits at an Island and is a mayoral appointee for the New York City Civic Engagement Commission. Dr. Bonner, we're so lucky. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. And for those of you who celebrate, I want to wish everybody a blessed uh, Palm Sunday, a blessed Ramadan, and blessed Passover. So thank you so much again for having me. I am a very proud social worker. 
I'm very proud to say that I went and got received my MSW and started and entered this line of work, um, and then ended up eventually kind of taking a turn into ministry. So my morning today started out preaching for Palm Sunday and is hopefully going to end uh, sharing some time with you all. So I'm I'm very excited. And one of the things that I want to emphasize in my presentation is really what social workers need to know. For those of you who are just graduating, for those of you who are maybe in the field now, when you talk about disability, there are some key factors that you really need to understand. First is that disability is complex. It's a complex identity. It's not something that is fixed. It is a mismatch between an individual's abilities and the environment and society that was built around them. Most people with disabilities struggle because we live in a very able-bodied world. And unfortunately, until that catches up with those of us who have various disabilities, we will always be behind the eight ball. Disability is definitely a lived experience, and it is very, very diverse. It's not a bad word to say that somebody is disabled. And disability can happen to anyone. It can happen to anyone that's sitting in this room right now, even social workers. And etiquette in the field is key. You must learn how to interact with those individuals who have disabilities in a respectful way. And here are just a little a couple of facts for you all regarding disability. 61 million people, 61 million in the United States have a disability. It's the largest minority group. One in five adults have a disability. One in four 20 year olds will have a disability before reaching retirement age. And one in seven people will never meet, meet a blind person. Now, as we move forward in the presentation, I want to let you know that congratulations, all of you are no longer in that one and seven because I myself am blind. And I'm going to talk a little bit more of that as we move forward. As we look at disability and as we look at the context of it, keep this in mind. Disabilities can be temporary and permanent. They can be visible and invisible. They can be congenital or they can be acquired, meaning that something happens that causes the person to have a disability that can be long lasting. This next slide is going to begin my talk about what happened to me as a social worker who eventually acquired a disability. It's a very personal journey. It's one that I share in my ministry, in my work as a social worker, and it's one that I share with you today. When I teach my students at Wagner College and in the other institutions that I teach, I do also teach them courses in social work. And I tell them that every social worker, every helper can use the five T's in their practice, in their ability as a helper, to go out to their community and make a difference. And those five T's are their time, their talent, their treasure, their tithe, and their testimony. Testimony comes from more of a ministerial background. It's basically your story. My story is very unique. And today I'm going to share with you my testimony of disability and social work. So I was diagnosed with intraductal carcinoma. It's a type of breast cancer when I was 19 years old. I was very young. This was in the late 1990s, and this was an extreme anomaly for somebody my age to have been diagnosed with this type of breast cancer. It took me going to three different doctors before I could even get my health insurance to pay for me to have a mammogram because I was so young, even though I detected a lump. And finally, after the third doctor, they did diagnose me with the introductal carcinoma and they recommended that I get treated with chemotherapy and radiation. Back in this time, having a radical mastectomy just wasn't something that was done. People told me that because of my age, I would want to keep my breasts in case I ever decided to have children and I would be able to breastfeed them. They also told me in the same breath that they didn't know if children were possible. They didn't think I would ever be a mother. So for most of my 20s, while I was attaining my bachelor's degree and trying to kind of find my way in the human, ser human service field, I bounced in and out of remission. And at 24, I was diagnosed with another type of breast cancer called Paget's disease. And patch disease is a breast cancer just that affects the nipple. I had a second relapse at the age of 28, and I was given additional chemo and radiation. So what happened with that chemo and radiation was that the doctors told me that they had a type of drug in a clinical trial, 
that they wanted me to um, be a part of. And they said it had a 2% chance of impacting, 2% impacting my optic nerve. So we took the drug because I didn't have another option. It was either that or I was going to pass away. And what happened is in the weeks and months following finishing that round of chemo, I started to have significant vision loss. I began to suffer from a lot of dry eye and had a lot of headaches. Then I was declared colorblind. I remember being at the Staten Island Mall with my husband and looking at a wrap of clothes and I said to him, well, everything is purple. It's purple the color of the season. And he said to me, those, those clothes aren't purple. He said, it just seems like something is getting worse with your eyes. You're not seeing color correctly. I went and saw an optic neurologist, which is a doctor that looks at the connection between your brain and what's behind the, the eye, the optic nerves. And he ended up treating me with a series of IV steroids and more antibiotics. And he gave me several different types of eye drops, but unfortunately he was not able to prevent the inevitable. And I was working at the time at a school as a school social worker in the New York City Department of Education. And I went to work uh, one day and I had a horrible headache. And I called my husband and I said to him, I didn't say I could drive home. I was able to drive still at the time. Um, so my husband came and picked me up. I came back to my house. And he advised me that maybe I should lay down and take a nap. And that week, January 3rd, 2012, I was 32 years old. And when I woke up, I couldn't see anything. I thought I had died. I thought I had cast away. The only thing that let me know that I was still alive is I had dogs. And I could hear the dogs barking in the house. And that let me know that my eyes had started to fail me and something was not right. And my husband came and scooped me up and took me right to the hospital. And once we got to the hospital, our worst fears were realized. My optic nerve in my left eye had completely detached, so I have no vision at all in my left eye. My right eye was very badly damaged, um, as the doctor had predicted, and I have about the size of an eraser cap vision in my eye. Now remember, this was after I graduated with my MSW, so I still was, like I said, as I said, a social worker. But going through this process, and having to go through the grief of losing my vision was not something that I was prepared for, nor do I think anybody could have been prepared for. And you got to remember that cooler Ross model. I went through the shock and disbelief, the sadness, the anxiety, the fear, the guilt, even suicidal ideation. I wanted to end my life. But I had to rely on the skills that I had learned as a social worker. I started to work the problem, as so many of us do. I started looking for resources. I had my husband use my cell phone to make contact with people that I had known in my field to try to help me figure out what I needed to be able to get through this horrible time, what type of resources I needed so I could start living my life as an independent person again. I reached out to the National Association of Social Workers, and eventually I found the New York State Commission for the Blind. So in every state, there is a commission for those of us who use our eyesight and they provide invaluable services like learning how to use a cane, learning how to do basic daily living skills in your house, like learning how to use your stove again, or even organizing your closet. And one of the things that this entire experience again reminds me is to be humble because sometimes a social worker needs a social worker. And I believe that God definitely has a sense of humor and I will always lean on my faith six months after losing my eyesight, I found out I was pregnant. I had never been able to conceive a child with my husband. We were married for 10 years. We had gone through multiple bouts of cancer. And here I was six months after losing my eyesight, two major life changes, losing my vision, finding out I was going to be a mom. My pregnancy was high risk, and I had no idea how carrying this child was going to impact my eyesight. And the public and my family did not have a lot of great things to say about a blind person expecting a baby. It was like I had made a very irresponsible decision. And here I was, an adult woman that was well-educated, had my own home, married in a committed relationship. And people would come up to me on the street, and I'd both go through these conversations in my family, and people would say, well, what's the plan? Are you keeping it? Who's the father? You know, I didn't think people like you were allowed to have children. How will you... Like, how are you going to get the kid to the pediatrician? How are you going to know if the baby has a diaper rash? How are you going to make a model? 
And don't you think that your child's life is going to be harder as you with, with a disability as a parent? So I started looking for online support, and there was nothing out there. There was no parent magazine that was addressing what was happening for somebody like me that had an acquired disability and had lost my eyesight. There was no videos on YouTube, and back then there was no TikTok on how to do anything, how to change a diaper, how to make a bottle for somebody in my situation. There were no mothers and fathers sharing their story. There was no dedicated space that I could go and I could try to find the answer to these questions. I felt alone and we were alone. So I reached out for support in the New York State Commission for the Blind again, and I reopened my case. I had previously closed it before finding out I was pregnant with my child after finishing all my circumstances. And they helped me prepare for my baby. They got me a doll. They got me pretend baby bottles that we practiced filling. Um, you know, they got me a carrier that I would try to lock into a carriage or put in an Uber. So this way I had to take my baby where I needed to go. And it, I had to learn how to turn out that negativity, the negativity that I was hearing in society. That was the hardest part. I prepared like the zombie apocalypse was coming. That was my, my goal. And I practiced with different things. And there was a lot of trial and error. And I set up different stations in my house. And by seven months pregnant, I felt like I was ready to go the best I could. Practice made, made perfect. Or as perfect as I was going to be as a blind mom. But I also had to do some letting go. There were a lot of people that were in my life that I had to let go because they would support me in my pregnancy. I had to establish my role as a mother with a disability who was going to take care of her child. As a social worker with a disability who knew I had the skills to do what I needed to do. No one else was going to be there to raise my kid. If people couldn't accept that, they had to say goodbye to me. And I started my website, Blind Motherhood. I was alone and I was scared and I wanted to take all those social worker skills that I had. And I used those social work skills to begin a website that showcased my unique personality but was something that was also very well organized so that any other blind parent could go on and see the route that I took to learn how to change a diaper, the route that I took to learn how to find a pediatrician that was going to work with me and make having my baby receive medical care accessible. It was a labor of love. And the mission of blind motherhood is to demonstrate that members of the blind and visually impaired community can parent safely, independently, and effectively. And the stories that we share are not just my own anymore. I have other mothers and fathers that also write contributes to this fight. And we seek to diminish those negative perceptions of parenting without sight. And we want to educate and enlighten, enlighten both the sighted and the blind. These are just a few of the media outlets that we've been featured on. Uh, People Magazine, Hallmark. I finally made it into that parent magazine. They showcased a story on blind parents. The Today Show. These are some of the highlights of my work that I never would have asked you if I had not used those skills in the social worker. So when you're working in the field, what do blind and vision impaired parents want? There's a picture of myself with my little girls when I had my first guide dog, Francis. I'm now on my second guide dog, a German Shepherd named Tegan. See how tiny my children were at the time. And this was me at the Staten Island Mall, and we got a lot of attention walking around the mall. One mommy with her two little ones. Both of them had bells on their shoes, so I could hear them as they kind of pitter-pattered next to me, and Franny would guide me around the mall. But what blind parents really want, and if you ever encounter them in your professional practice, is they want you to embody that disability etiquette. Remember that somebody with a disability is a person. You don't bring up the disability unless it's relevant to the conversation. You're going to use that people-first language. You're going to reference that person first, then the disability, only if it's necessary. And you're not going to label your client as somebody with a disability unless it's relevant to your case and then they're comfortable with it. Change your mindset with the use of handicapped or disabled. Use a person with a disability. Replace handicapped with the word accessible. It makes it more friendly to everyone. Instead of handicapped parking, you're going to want to use accessible parking. Do not park in the designated spaces. Do not park in the lines next to the spaces. If you are a sighted person out in the community, do me a favor, stay out of my bathroom. I want to be able to use an accessible bathroom with my children. I want my husband to be able to park in an accessible spot so that I can get my children safely out where I need to go. Always embody the integrity of a social worker 
whether you're in the office or in the, in the community. Keep that with you. Instead of that handicapped restroom, accessible re restroom. Instead of deaf person, blind person, confined wheelchair bound person, mentally challenged person, disabled, whatever group you want to apply it to, a person who is whatever, a person who is blind, a person who is deaf. Remember, person first. And don't be rude when you meet somebody with a disability. As social workers, it's often very easy to forget, especially when you have multiple clients or you're feeling overwhelmed at work. You don't want to ask what happened, what's wrong, were you born that way? A person's story is personal. I just shared my story with you because I feel like it will help you on your journey. But don't assume and don't play detective. Don't go through searching through social media to find out what would happen to a person, how they lost the limb, or how they maybe acquired an injury. It's not worth it. Let the person have the relationship build with you so that they will want to share it when they are ready. And stop with the euphemism. No handy capable, no different be able, no special, no challenge. Do away with that. And remember to look at these invisible disabilities and be aware of them because not everything is physical. So depression, anxiety, PTSD, or traumatic brain injuries, um, blood disorders, diabetes, and so many others. When you help children with disabilities, you want to encourage their independence. Let them learn and play and explore and be there to support them. Don't just label them as special needs, right? It's not special needs, it's human needs. And hearing impaired in deafness, you will absolutely encounter some of these people in your job, in your employment history, in whatever organization that you're working with, right? Establish the visible co visual contact with them. Follow their cues. Don't shout or yell at them. It's not going to make a difference. Ask the person how they want to communicate with you. And always use an interpreter if you can. Same thing with blind and visually impaired. You want to use a conversational tone. I cannot tell you how many people yell at me on a daily basis because they think that I can't hear them. And I have to remind them, I'm visually impaired. I'm not deaf. I can hear you. Speak directly to me. Greet me when I enter the room. Offer somebody who's blind or visually impaired always your elbow, never your hand. We don't know where your hands have been. And if you touch your hand and then touch our face, we could end up with an eye infection, and that can take away our residual vision. Right? And when a service animal is working, you see my beautiful dog, Tegan, here. Don't touch them, as tempting as it is. She is an extension of me, and she has my CC in her hand. Try to avoid that. Make sure you respect these assistive devices that you see with your client. Don't push the person's wheelchair unless that. Don't move a cane or a wheelchair or a walker or a rollator. Don't touch them. If the person needs you to do it, they will ask for your assistance. And please, 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 if you remember nothing else from this presentation, be conscious about your office. Environmental barriers create a handicap, but people themselves are not the handicap. So if you are in an office space, a physical space, that you have heavy, narrow doors or there's stairways or curves, keep your office clean and streamlined. Make a way for somebody with a disability to come in and feel safe navigating through that. And avoid your microaggression. I don't see you using your guide dog all the time or, oh, you look so normal. How do you live like that? You're such an inspiration. Don't be surprised if the person that you're talking to has a degree or a family or is married. We do all kinds of things with disabilities and we do them just like everybody else. Important takeaways, people first language, eliminate effective language, and forget the goals and rules. This is the platinum rule. Treat others how they would like to be treated. Take the new out of, the, out of it. Don't be afraid or too shy to ask for help, social worker. Make contacts in the community with disabled people, people that worked with disabled people. They will help you along the way. Practice that disability etiquette. Embody it. Teach your clients how to advocate for themselves. That is the greatest gift you can ever give a client. Teach them how to advocate for themselves. Know those local and national resources and make a space for disabled social workers at your organization. There have to be more people like myself that are in this field out working, and if you ever encounter them, Make them feel like they are part of your team. I wish you all luck and safety and joy this Holy Week season. And if I can ever assist any of you, please don't hesitate to use my contact information, whether it's now or five years from now. You all met a blind social worker today that's also a guide dog user. 
and I'm happy to help you in any way I can. Thank you very much. Hi, Dr. Bonner, this is Julia. I just want to thank you so much again for being here. We always really appreciate um, your willingness to share your story, as powerful as it is. So, fortunately, we are able to skip the Q&A at this time, but we appreciate you um, today reaching out over con your contact information. Um, both of our speakers are the same way, so if you have anyone that you do want to reach out to, uh, we can share contact information. We should have time at the end for some networking if you want to ask some questions here. Um, so next, we're going to have a late addition to um, the schedule. So I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Shirley Kitten, you'll be able to introduce the next speaker. Well, not the next speaker. I, I just wanted, you know, this day is about students and students who have organized the day, and it's about student learning. Um, but I wanted you to know that as educators, we are also very interested in learning alongside you. And we have a couple of guests that represent our leading social work associations here in the United States. And I just wanted you to be able to meet them and to speak to them, um, know who they are so that you could speak with them during the networking session. Um, at, from CSWE, we have a new president and CEO. And so I'd like to in introduce Halavalu Vakalahi. If you could just say hi. <laughs> Also from CSWE, and Tanya, you're going to yell at me, but you're the Vice President of Education, right? And um, uh, your staff with you, um, Massa Fulund at Fias, and Joseph Bess. And um, from NASW, we have the uh, President of the Maryland Chapter, Stephanie Hassari. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gable, for introducing those people who let's meet them during the networking session. Dr. Bowner has an amazing story and has encouraged us to dig deeper into the lived experience of individuals with disabilities both here and abroad. When we have these conversations, we often think of the adage, nothing about us without us. For that reason, we've created the following video to share the lived experiences of individuals with disabilities internationally. It was amazing to have received so many clips from people around the world and we're pleased to say that there will be an even longer version of this video shared in the coming weeks. Following the presentation of the video, it is an honor to introduce Linda Levin to conclude with a call to action. Linda Levin is a recent MSW graduate from Fordham University Graduate School of Social Service in New York City, having earned her Bachelor of Science in Social Work with a focus in Disability Studies at Cooney College of Staten Island. She completed her field placement at the United Nations and was a student representative for the International Federation of Social Work. Linda has diligently remained active in her community, co-developing a community of practice fellowship, public conversations for change fellowship as part of the Equity and Belonging Project to promote anti-racist, equitable, positive solutions and inclusion. Linda is most passionate about advancing human rights, public health, disaster preparedness, and accessibility justice. And now let's hear from some of our community members. Thank you so much to all the participants who wanted to share their experience and help us put this video together. This video shows different perspectives of disability from people around the world. Sometimes ourselves as disabled people, we won't know much on how to make a survey more accessible because each disability is different. When I felt more included is when my employer, my teacher, my coworker, my friend simply asks me. Sometimes I won't know the answer, but together we can find a way. Comunicación, tanto en las redes sociales para las personas que están en la condición y que las personas sean más convenientes a a las personas que están en la condición. Especialmente más de los jóvenes que ni ellos han pedalings ni cada quien es ni cada cual era de ni. Tú me eres que no es que ni han pe People who do not have a disability do not understand why Michael wrote the songs that he did. But I get it. I know how it feels to have a light on you when you don't want the light there. 
کہ یہاں پہ یہ جو ایجوکیشن کی سہولیات یا اسکل ڈیولپ اسکل کے حوالے سے ہمیں کوئی اپارچونیٹی نہیں جاتے تو گلگت بلتستان میں موجود مابینہ افراد کسی سے کم نہیں ہے وہ بآسانی اپنی مدد آپ کے تحت کام کر کے اپنی روزمرہ زندگی کام کر سکتے اس کے علاوہ سیکٹر میں دیکھو تمہیں میں گوتا لیا ہوں ان کا بھی گران دے پور کے سیمپر انوسوتر کو آنے پر سمجھ دیکھتا پاکستا ہے نو میرا ہاتھا میں ہوں میں دیکھو نو میرا ویسے کو ہوں پوکیتو دے دیسپریسیو اور کے انکلوی اگر لا فرکونا ہے con discapacidad como personas normales, porque también somos normales nosotros. Sabía que las personas sin discapacidad supieron que la discapacidad no es sinónimo de enfermedad, ni personas extrañas, ni castigo divino. Somos personas como todos, con derechos, obligaciones, sueños, anhelos. Y aquí, en la mayoría de los estudios, hay que ir a la admisión. Si alguien va a la admisión, va a la admisión, فارم پہ جاتے ہیں تو بیٹھنے کی جگہ نہیں ملتے ایک حقیق کی حقیق سمجھا جاتا ہے اور ایک بوجھ سمجھا جاتا ہے اور اس سوچ کو ختم کرنے کے لیے ہم ہر ادارے پہ ہر پلیٹ فارم پہ ہر جگہ پہ ہم آواز بھی اٹھا رہے但一楼没有卫生间银行只有两层楼所以没有电梯对于健全的人来说呢这个不成问题所以但是对我妈来说就不太难了那时候呢我就想真的希望国家可以让呢银行可以为那旁边的随便一个人我去担任了所以没有 Dice que en la medicina, porque no hay medicina, no hay médico para la atención. No hay servicio social, también que nos ayuden. A veces no busco una ayuda y no, no encuentro, ya no hay esta ayuda. The word must now realize that the fundamental issue is not disability, but the lack of accessibility. For example, if I give the newspaper to a person who search in a room, And then I turn off the light and tell him that read the newspaper. Well, he, because I made him disabled, I made him disabled, I made him blind by not providing light by turning off the light. That would mean that environment made us disabled. That we are lacking to access the uh, education, we are lacking to access the transport, we are lacking to access the mosques, and so on. Nothing about us without us. Thank you for watching. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you joining us here in person in New York City and everyone virtually around the world. My name is Linda Levin. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a white Hispanic female. Um, I currently have long black hair. It's pulled back. I'm wearing glasses and a green, very bright green blazer and there should be a very plain beige wall behind me um, on the right side of your oh, on the right side of the screen you will see a photo of me for accessibility I am at the podium at the Great Assembly at UN New York so firstly I would like to congratulate the Student Steering Committee for developing an empowering and amazing conference today that truly centered and emphasized and elevated the voices of people with disabilities both here in the United States and around the world Um, if we would like to show that true justice is in dismantling the systems that continuously oppress and limit the bodies of access that, are, that they rightfully deserve. So I'd also like to thank them for me to speak. Um, just a year ago, I had the privilege of organizing the Global Student Conference. <laughs> As I was the IFSW student representative uh, for Fordham University with my human rights partner in crime. It wasn't really crime, it was in advocacy, uh, Melina. We were kind of considered peanut butter and jelly. Um, and like they said, I received my Bachelor's of Science in Social Work with a focus in disability justice from the CUNY College of Staten Island, which if you don't know, the university is actually on the campus of the Willowbrook State School. And so that probably really centers the fact that when we learned about the atrocities that happened on the campus that we were educated, it truly centered and reminded us how important was advocacy. Um, it was in the dedication of those advocates that that institution even shut down. 
It was why policies were passed that continue to support people with disabilities today. So as social workers, advocacy is centered in the work that we do, whether that's with clients, committees, and organizations, or internationally, which is important, guys. Um, as, well, sorry. as was mentioned earlier, um, there's also an importance of caregiving uh, that was mentioned earlier, and I am also the primary caregiver to both of my parents. My mom, for instance, is physically disabled and has dementia. That means that I have the unique responsibility to advocate for them and all of their needs. And if there's one thing you need to know about me, I am a dedicated and very persistent advocate. Um, we would, I don't even know what the next slide is. Um, we know that the world is, uh, we know that the world, the world is easier for all people when we center accessibility. So I have a little bit of questions too. How many of us use an automatic door when we're at supermarkets, malls, or maybe even to get into this building today? Strand. Okay. Um, have you ever used a electric toothbrush? Okay. Um, this one's going to be really difficult to really think about it. Have you ever used a keyboard? Okay. Well, all of those things were created to help a person with a disability. Yet that made all of our lives easier. Now let's think about something that may you remember, and that's the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Disability advocates have been fighting for work from home opportunities for decades. And yet when the health and well-being of able-bodied peoples were affected, we saw how easy it was to transition to a work from home environment. And we're kind of losing that, that sustainability and making, forcing everyone to come back. I'd also like to remind you that everyone should be wearing a mask. So I'm going to ask you now, how are you going to advocate for accessibility? Reverend Dr. Holly Bonner, who I have the privilege of knowing uh, very well, isn't she awesome? Um, um, she gave you really practical examples of that. Person first language, eliminating offensive language like this global student conference was insane. Not good. Uh, it's making sure that you self-identify yourself, like saying your name before you, when you're having a conference or how I introduced myself earlier. It's making sure that your board members are diverse and they represent the community that you're serving. Using accessible fonts when you do a PowerPoint or using tools to make sure that your colors, can, uh, people can see that. Or when you're doing a flyer for an event, making sure that that's accessible. Having your PowerPoints ready before you even have the presentation. Make sure you find funding so that you have ASL interpreters. Or wearing a mask because we must all protect people who are immunocompromised. I'm not. Last page, guys. We're almost done. Unlike many, <laughs> so but unlike many that we've heard from that are during this conference, I'm actually an able-bodied person. So more than an advocate, I am personally and professionally, uh, I consider myself a imperfect but committed ally. I try to show up in every single room that I am and try to focus on anti-racist and accessible principles. And just like Julia said in the beginning of this conference, we can all strive to do better. So that's what I'd like to ask all of you joining today. After this conference is over, how are you going to be a better ally? How might you show up in your classrooms, in your field placements, your jobs, your communities to be committed allies for people living with disabilities? As social workers, which all of you are, even the students, we uh, truly want true equity. Let's just move on. Uh, we truly want true equity to liberate people from the oppressive systems um, so after we leave this conference, we must be committed to centering accessibility. So what's your first step? I implore you to see how you show up for others and think about what you can do. How might you be an agent of change? So I would like to end today with something to honor the disability advocate that we lost this year, the amazing Judith um, Human, who I had the luxury of meeting when her um, documentary came out and I've read her book and she's an amazing person, so I told you to read that, but her memoir is called Being Human. And she ends her book by discussing the disability rights movement that she led as a true activist. And she says that its success became because it hinges on collaboration. So she says, when we are united, progress happens for we are, we are our leaders of inclusiveness and community of love, equity, and justice. And as social workers who work in a multitude of settings in various communities, that's true of all of you. So to become the leaders of inclusiveness, equity, and justice, so we can empower and liberate the world, how will you be an ally? 
Yeah, we're done. We have a Okay, it's working. <laughs> Thank you, Linda, for those amazing words in the call of action. Your star. <laughs> Yo, it's hard, bro. <laughs> but I just, I just want to take the opportunity to thank every single one of our amazing speakers. You guys are doing the work that everyone should do. And um, just like, I just want to recall what um, what Benedita said on her video about let the walls of oppression crumble down. So it's our job has it's our job as future social workers to to emphasize the importance of inclusion for people and not let not taking the spotlight of people with disabilities we need to understand anything that is about them no without them so we have to take those steps as social workers um so i know Everyone might be like very excited to come and ask some amazing questions to our speakers. So I open the floor for everyone. But thank you so much for, thank you for mo so much for being here, for listening to us, to listen to our speakers, and also to listen to uh, the video that we pulled out there for people around the world. We reached out to seven different countries and we got, uh, and we actually got a response from four countries. Um, so it's very important that we listen to and use a people-centered approach when we ask people. We must ask people how they want to be, how they want to be identified, how they want to be called, how they want to, how they want us to help them out. So we have to ask. So uh, thank you so much to the IFSW, ISSW, and ICSW. We have a pretty fun event tomorrow that it's more international wise. So it's a social work day at the United Nations. And I hope to see every one of you out there. So um, with that said, I'll be open now the floor for questions. So thank you guys. Any questions? <laughs> Sure. Okay, Sandra. Question is for um, Olusula um, about your organization. I really resonated with a lot what you said specifically for training employers on how to be more inclusive for people who do have disabilities. I just wanted um, to hear a specific example from you, either advice or strategies that you give to employers, specifically managers. Those who are higher up that don't really work with direct programming that often, how can they be more inclusive to um, new employees who have d disabilities and they just found out that, oh, Sarah has a you know physical disability or mental health disability. How can managers accommodate that person when they just find out for the first time? Thank you. I think that's a very really great question. Uh, so um, there are a lot of things really uh, that should that that's um, help to put things in place for persons with disabilities. Actually, one of the organizations we worked with, they carried out a disability survey and realized that four of their existing um, employees already had disability and they didn't disclose. And we decided to do things around their ability increase. So I think it's only start from organizational policies. Uh, what that means is it's no longer at the discretion of whoever is interacting with a person with disability. There are standards and procedure and things that has to be done. And then we do a lot of training with respect to conscious and unconscious bias that people may have. And that is usually, we ensure that it's done at the topmost level, as much as we also do it at, um, you know, um, HR and all. But for top managers, what people will make decisions, it's really important that they understand that and they encourage it. And that is talking about leadership and leading disability inclusive uh, organization. Uh, so I think that's mostly, by the end of the day, we can't really, in the session of training, prepare people to interact with persons with disability and all, other than helping them realize that, uh, just like the other speakers said, ask question, how do you want us to? If the conscious and unconscious bias discussed and people are open, then asking that question becomes easy. It's people then at the point where they really want to help. And at that level, it's not like we have everything that you are asking us to do as I employ you with disability but it is that we are willing to do whatever we can and provide the uh provisions necessary to get
Thank you. Um, I have a question for you, Linda. I know Olisola spoke about it a little bit as well. Um, we touched a little bit about caretakers. So I'm wondering if there are any organizations or projects, anything you know of, which caretakers are the focus? And if not, what are some things that social workers could do to advocate for that group specifically? Did you get a question for me? Um, so caretaking is really difficult because it's pretty much yourself. And so self-care is probably the number one thing that any caretaker can focus on and center for themselves. Um, most nonprofits are, if they focus on different uh, children or memory loss or however someone is taking care of them, they usually have groups of support and people can join. But definitely as social workers promote self-care, including for yourselves, because I could tell you that's the best thing I could do and it doesn't happen too often. Sure, sweet. The networking. <laughs> Thank you, Benedict. We really appreciate your participation. Um, if there aren't any more questions right now, or if people are not comfortable speaking in front of the entire group, um, I think we're going to open it up. So eventually, essentially, we're finished with the presentation portion, so you're free to do anything. If you're feeling mancure, you're free to come up and ask questions um, and network with each other. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, I think we are a space gear comfortable sharing your side thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.